morning, everybody. Me again. <laughs> uh, so, just a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I work for a university. I used to do a lot of research in wireless networks. Uh, unfortunately, not anymore. I do some work in cybersecurity now, but still, I'm um, still very involved with uh, the apps I started uh, writing five, six years ago. Um, and this is what it's about, uh, the presentation is about. So it's just, I'm gonna try to get this 30 minutes. Can I get the timer, Keith? Yeah. yeah. To talk about uh, the work I've done uh, with my apps and how you can use them uh, in your daily basis uh, for troubleshooting stuff. Um, if you don't have a Mac, then um, don't worry. I mean, I'll, I guess some of the stuff I'll be talking about is still useful. Um, <clears throat> so just, I get this question asked a lot. So how did I start it? Uh, how did I start working on, on the apps? So I'm just gonna give a very brief history the iPhone comes out, uh, you know, years ago. I wrote this uh, little app for the iPhone, so it was called Wi Fi Analyzer, uh, mainly because I needed something for what I was doing back then with wireless networks. It would give you, you know, some graphs there, like the channels and network uh, signal strength stuff. Then uh, Apple came. Uh, abolishes the Wi-Fi scanner from the App Store, and then I cry, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, well, my heart was broken, but then I came up with this idea of coming, uh, writing the app, like a desktop version of Wi-Fi Analyzer, so that's how Wi-Fi Explorer was born. Uh, this is version 1.0, um, but uh, this is how it looks. Today, it's a pretty simple interface. Uh, has some uh, area with tabs for giving you details about the networks and charts. Then a list of the networks it finds. It's a, well, Wi-Fi Explorer is a Wi-Fi scanner, pretty much. Uh, um, it has some uh, very cool uh, filtering, and, and that's pretty much, I mean, it's very, straightforward to use, and um, my main goal with Wi-Fi Explorer is to have a tool that people can go, just launch it, and see what's going on in the network. And then if they wanna, you know, pull uh, out a uh, Hekaho or Metagig's IPA, whatever they want, they can do that, but Wi-Fi Explorer is kind of give you a reference of, what, of what's going on in the environment, what networks are there, um, what channels are being used, so it has a, a so some of the features you can uh, well some of the feature, one of the features that people uh, users like a lot is the advanced uh, tab the advanced details tab it gives you uh, uh, full details on the beacons and the information elements on the beacons uh, so you don't have to do a capture to get that information it's just right there. You can save the results. It has, it has some uh, AP name discovery for uh, IPs that support that, Cisco, Aruba. Um, has one column that you can use for annotations. So you can do that with labels like, I don't know, this is, IP in the, this, is, this is IP in the main office or conference room, whatever. So it's easier to track in the list of networks or in the charts. Uh, then I... I started crying again because there are some limitations in what things I could do with the framework I was allowed to use for Wi-Fi Explorer 2. So I could only do active scans. Uh, there, there's no support for hidden networks. And it's, it gives, the framework kind of gives you inconsistent scan results and I'll explain that later, why, uh, why is that? Um, so then Mac, uh, Apple came up with uh, enforcing sandboxing, which is kind of a security stuff for apps, uh, for apps distributed in the Mac App Store. So I couldn't kind of 
continue working on adding more features to the app. I got some restrictions there. So I said, well, what the heck, I'm gonna do a Wi-Fi Explorer Pro that I'm gonna distribute you know, directly from my website. So that's, that's uh, the Pro version. Uh, it has a dark theme, which uh, I, at the beginning I found it was cool, but then I, uh, I liked more the other, the light theme. Um, so Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, it builds on top of Wi-Fi Explorer's code base, but it has some, I think, nice features for users like you guys. Um, it has active and, passing, active and passive scanning. It has some spectrum analysis integration. Uh, it supports external USB adapters uh, with a little hack I came up with. Has some support for remote sensor, sensors. The people who were in the deep dive with Jerry, I think uh, they tried the uh, NanoPi has a remote sensor for Wi-Fi Explorer Pro. Has a different way of organizing the results, the list of uh, networks. It adds some support for uh, the airport utility app. Uh, the thing that uh, Eric was showing us on Tuesday about uh, scanning using this iOS app. And some enhanced filtering as well. So first the scan modes. So you already know, you know, there are two scan modes, active, passive. Um, so the app supports both. Uh, passive mode requires to use uh, the monitor mode, which is supported in all the, you know, all Macs. Uh, the good thing about passive is that it can uh, give you information about hidden networks, and it's, uh, I, I think, it's more stable. The results, the list of results you get, is more stable. The readings of the signal strength. <clears throat> So I already talked about monitor mode in my other ten, uh, ten talk. You know, it's this mode that you put the interface on so you can capture control management data frames. Um, and it, uh, not all drivers support it, supports it, but um, in the Mac, that's, uh, that's one of the cool things about the Mac, you know, it, it just works. Uh, so some observations. Um, when you're doing an active scan, the props, the prop requests that it gets sent, because you have to send a prop request and get the prop response from the AP, are not retransmitted because they are just a broadcast transmission. So they are just sent. They are usually, usually the client sends a bunch of them, you know, I have seen, I think, uh, in some tests uh, about uh, four or five proof requests sent on each channel when it's scanning. But sometimes because of interference or whatever, these requests, uh, these frame uh, are lost, and then you don't get the, re the proof response back. So you see those uh, drops in when you're tracking the signal strength of the AP, you see like, a, like, a, like it's disappeared for a second and then it came back. It's just because of that, because the proof the uh, request was lost and it couldn't get a proof response. So that's why the, uh, the passive scanning works better, although um, it depends on how long the client waits to listen for beacons. So in Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, I think I wait about 150 milliseconds, although I, uh, I adjust the time to make the scan faster. So if I don't see any uh, beacons in that channel, I reduce the interval because I'm assuming there's nothing out there. So I can scan channels that are unoccupied, usually DFS channels more quickly than the channels that are, you know, they have something in there. <clears throat> so now the, the success of the accuracy of passive scanning depends on the beacon interval set on the AP. Usually it's just 102.4 milliseconds, but for some reasons that uh, are unclear to me, some, some people uh, change the beacon intervals, some people choose to use larger intervals, shorter intervals, so that could affect the results of the scan. But uh, I mean, if you're using just 
the default 102.4, then it should be fine. So this is a table that summarizes more or less what you can get with active and passive scanning. So the method for active scanning is this proof request response has changed. Passive scanning, uh, the client listens for beacons, the speed, the active scanning was specifically designed to be faster because you send the proof request, you get the proof response, you move on. <coughs> With, well, with, with some you know, time window to wait for uh, the response. The passive scanning, you, you have to wait a little bit longer for it, so it's a slower. I mean, the difference is not much long, but for example, in Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, if you're doing active scan, I think the scan can take three, four seconds. A passive scanning takes seven, eight seconds to scan the whole list of supported channels of the interface. Active scanning can be used while associated, Passive scanning, you need, to need, you need to disconnect from the network, put the interface in monitor mode, and then, so you cannot be associated. And the scan range for active scanning is shorter, and the passive scanning is larger. What is the scan range? It's, it's pretty much this. So clients, like the computer, your computer usually transmit, a, you know, uses lower transmit power. So when you send the proof, request, it might not reach APs that are farther away, so you don't get a response. So you can, you, you see less, if you run an active scan, you might see less networks nearby than if you run the passive scan, because in the passive scan, the, the access point is sending the beacon, and initially transmits at a higher transmit power, so it reaches the client. Now, also the AP has better antennas, stuff like that, so there's, there is this mismatch that makes uh, the, the, the number of networks you find different depending on what method you use, active or passive scanning. Um, about the spectrum analysis integration, you know, it's very simple. I don't pretend Wi-Fi Explorer Pro to be a dedicated spectrum analysis application. It's just so we can overlay the Wi-Fi information with the spectrum, with the RF. Uh, so you could uh, identify non-802.11 uh, energy sources of interference or take a look at channel utilization. Uh, I mean, but it's not a dedicated uh, uh, spectrum analysis. You want something dedicated, you, you know, you get a channelizer or a ECHOS uh, spectrum analysis component. <coughs> um, so some of the supported devices, uh, I support the MetaGix YSPY 2.4X and DVX. The nice thing about DVX, and I think, and every time someone asks me, well, which one do you recommend? I usually recommend the DVX because it, uh, it, I mean, it works and you, ca uh, you can scan, it's, it's dual band because you can scan 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. It doesn't mean you can scan both at the same time. But in Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, I made it so that uh, it in, in, um, alternates between bands very quickly, so you can get like an idea of both bands at the same time. You might miss some information, but you get like a quick picture of both at the same time. Uh, also supports the Cajo Spectrum Analyzer, which is kind of a rebranding of the MetaGix one, so same chipset. The RF Explorer, which is a handheld, um, Spectrum analysis tool that I think uh, you're going to hear uh, Stephen uh, do a 10 talk later tonight, uh, t this afternoon. Uh, the Ubertooth one, which is a little adapter to scan for Bluetooth networks, can be used for that too. And the HackRF one uh, that uh, you were using for the deep dives can be used for uh, spectrum analysis. So, organizing the results. Uh, the app can organize the results by access point, access points radio, a network name, so it can quickly give you like a, you know, a quick view of the number of access points as opposed to the number of networks that are nearby. I use different heuristics uh, to do this, uh, to make this uh, grouping work because um, there is no standard way to generate the BSSID when you're using uh, virtual, uh, this virtual business ideas. Um, and for example, Meraki has a strange way of doing it. 
But the good thing is that they have great documentation about it. So there's a document online that you can get and it explains, okay, this is the base MAC, uh, MAC address for the access point. This is what you get when you are generating multiple SSIDs in 2.4, multiple SSIDs in 5 gigahertz. So for other vendors, I have to kind of guess and, you know, okay, I think they are changing the last octet or changing this first octet, in, but it works in pretty well in general. <coughs> Airport utility integration. This is uh, one feature that um, Eric and Apple guy asked uh, about it, and I said, well, let's see if we can pull up something. So the airport utility, uh, you can go there, do a scan, and it's pretty easy to use. You just, once you are scanning, you tap on the share button, and then you choose copy, you switch to your Mac and you paste the results. And then there you can see the results in Wi-Fi Explorer. So the same, same layout you get when you are using the tool for scanning using the Mac. Uh, you can also send the results uh, on an email and the person can open the email, do select all, it will select all the text, including the signatures or whatever other text is at the bottom. You paste it and the Wi-Fi Explorer will automatically detect what is the data of the scan, ignore the signatures of the email and stuff, and paste it and visualize the data. Now, this is kind of a, it can be used uh, also in a genetic way. Uh, Nigel, he, he's not here uh, this year, but he wrote a script that scans on a Linux machine. It generates the same CSV file format that the airport utility generates and he, he can import that. You can import that CSV into Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, so you can scan on Linux too and get to, uh, get to see the results in the tool as well. Remote sensors. Uh, this is something uh, I worked with Jerry uh, last year. Uh, pretty much it's a, a Python script that you can install on any Linux computer can be uh, you know, a full-size computer, but the idea is to have a, like a, the NanoPy or the Odroid computer and install the script, and then you can connect to this computer and initiate a scan, it's a passive scan, get the results back, and visualize those results in the tool. That's the address of the GitHub repository that has the script. You can download it, install it, and try it uh, on any, you know, if you have a Raspberry Pi, an Android, as long as it has a capable adapter of, uh, and what I mean by that is a, an adapter that can be used in monitor mode, then you should be able to use uh, the remote sensor functionality. Uh, external adapters, so this is something that, um, you know, might not be used by many, but sometimes it's coming, it comes in handy, especially if you are, if you wanted to be scanning and also doing some maybe tests, so you can use the built or still get, uh, still be connected to the internet, so you can use the built-in adapter of the Mac to be connected and use this external adapter to scan. And the way it works is, it's a, it's a cool hack. It's just you install uh, this virtual machine on your Mac using VirtualBox. It's a lightweight uh, custom Debian VM that has all the drivers uh, uh, already installed. And uh, when you launch Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, Wi-Fi Explorer Pro tries to connect to that local VM. And if it's there, then it queries the VM for the list of adapters that are connected to the USB port. And then it can using the same remote sensor script, but now running as a local sensor, it, query, it starts scanning using the standard adapter and then you get to see the results in the tool. Uh, uh, I named this thing uh, external adapter support environment is, and it's pretty easy to configure. You just go, uh, you have to install VirtualBox, um, Vagrant, which is a provisioning tool, and then you download a file, you, do, you run Vagrant app in your terminal, and that takes care of downloading the image, installing the drivers, doing all the configuration, setting up the sensor, and you are done. You launch Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, you connect the USB adapter, and 
you can see it uh, there as an option. So you see the Realtek uh, 802.11n, the Rail Link, and uh, there's a. Uh, so if, if the adapter works in Linux for scanning using monitor mode, it will probably it will you know work in this uh, setup. Mm. Enhance filtering. So there are different ways to filter results, uh, which I think is important to have a very good filtering capabilities in a tool because you get a lot of information and sometimes you don't care about you know all what's there and you want to focus on a certain network. So it has uh, some predefined filters. It has automatic the de right filters, which is that list on the left kind of list. Uh, if you click on one network name, then it will only show the networks uh, that has that SSID. It has a filter field that is pretty easy to use and some keyboard shortcuts that I'm gonna be showing. So this is a table that summarizes the filter, filter syntax that I use. It's not as comprehensive as the, as the Wireshark filter syntax. It's, it's not the idea. It's actually pretty easy to use. For example, you want to filter by network name, annotations, vendor or device name, just start typing text. It will, it will try to filter by those. Then uh, by ID, you type colon and you know, the X values of the FSS ID, you get to filter by that. And then you have others, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but uh, channel, you just type a number and it will filter by channel. So it tries to be smart about what being entered in the filter field, um, you can combine. So you can use comma to do, okay, give me, so you, you say one comma six, it means Give me the network, uh, show me the networks that are on channel one or channel six. And, and the ampersand to do an end, like one N conference center, mean, meaning show me the networks that are in channel one and that are named conference center. You can negate the filters by uh, uh, using the prefix, the exclamation mark prefix. You can also do a quick filtering by RSSI by using the keyboard. So you do option uh, seven and you get those networks that are above next 70 dBm. And that's the list, you know. And then if you use the letters underneath the numbers like T, Y, U, I, O, then you get like intermediate values. So instead of negative Next 70 and 80, you get neck 75, which is letter U between seven and eight. So um, that's a quick you know, way of filtering the, by signal strength, which you can also use uh, the filter field. You see there, the third row, you can use greater, lower, greater or equal, lower or equal, smaller or equal. <coughs> AP name discovery. So it supports Apple, Cisco, Aruba, Extreme Networks, formerly Zebra, router board with some caveats. Uh, Apple, it only works when it's associated and it does that by using, because it requires Bonjour, so it needs an IP and stuff to get you know, the names of the a a Apple access point, uh, the Airport Extreme and Airport Express. Um, and the Aruba, support, it only works in passive mode because for some reason, Aruba doesn't include the name on the proof responses, only on the beacons. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, that's how it works. And um, usually you have to go to the controller and configure the access, the, configure it to, to include the name in the beacon. Same for uh, Cisco uses uh, CCX extensions, uh, information elements. Uh, Zebra uses a uh, 221 information element and the same as router board. Uh, annotations, mm. as I said, this can be used to, you know, add labels to the networks and you can use this as a substitute if you don't, if your infrastructure doesn't support the AP name stuff, you can get a list of AP names generated from somewhere and a list of SSIDs, you can import that, 
as annotations, and then you get, get kind of the AP names for the different networks. Uh, this is also another feature that uh, users like a lot is, is, is the display of the channel session and station count for from the QBSS load information element. Uh, some people get confused and think that this is something I'm, you know, computing from the results or from what I see in the air, but no, it's, it's not. It's the information I get from that information element. Channel utilization, percentage of time the AP sends the medium, and this is as defined by this QBSS element and the number of stations or clients connected to the access point radio. Uh, it can also, there is some additional columns, uh, beacon airtime, beacon interval. Airtime is uh, calculates the duration or how long it takes to transmit the beacon. In this, and uh, it does that uh, using the, based on the preamble frame size and transmit data rate set for the beacons. And this inform, the idea when I implemented that was because I wanted to compute like, an, a, beacon, like a beacon overhead. I don't know if you can see in the Andrew's uh, SSID overhead calculator. So he has this calculator to uh, estimate the overhead based on the number of AP, APs, the size of the beacon, the, the data rights and stuff. So what I'm doing here, and this is uh, something I'm gonna include in the next update is uh, on the right side, you're gonna see like the, the list of channels, the number of networks on that channel, and the beacon overhead for that uh, channel. So you get kind of, it's the actual, you know, it's based on the number of bytes that, that I'm getting for, for each of the beacons and the data rights, all the configurations. So you see that uh, this is a scan, uh, it's a lab environment. Uh, so there's a bunch of networks. You see that channel one has a 58% beacon overhead, which means 58% of the time is being used just to transmit the beacons. Uh, and I only have three minutes left. Uh, copying information, uh, you can quickly count comments, uh, command C on a row or in the information element in the advanced detail and just paste that on an email. It will format it for you in a you know, nice way. So it's some, uh, a way you can quickly share information with somebody if you're troubleshooting. More fun stuff, there's support for emoji in SSIDs as well as non-Latin character sets like Chinese uh, network names or, you know, just funny names. There are some additional columns for some Cisco CCX extensions uh, for DT DTPC MF and uh, the management frame protection, whether or not it's enabled, uh, and some fast BBS transition. I work with Sam on, on including some uh, support for Cisco's, uh, Cisco's adaptive Fero 2.11R. Uh, Okay, now Wi-Fi signal is another tool. It's a menu bar tool that you can use to monitor the, your uh, the connection, your, uh, your network, the network you are connected to. It's a, it has a customizable status display and it provides some notifications and event login. So you can go there to the preferences of the tool and just said, okay, I wanna see in the menu bar, I wanna see the network name, the channel and the channel width, or I wanna see the MCS index, or I wanna see the mode that running the network. So you can kind of configure what you wanna see in the menu bar. You can also hide the bars if you don't care about, you know, that you also got the Apple little thingy for displaying the single strength. Uh, has some notifications. So you can configure it to, no, to notify you when you connect to a network, or disconnect from the network, or when, which I think is nice, when you roam. So you, you're walking, you change to another access point, you will get a notification saying, okay, you disconnected from this access point, you are not connected to this access point. And you can also log those events and export them uh, as text, as CSV. Um, you see there a list of roaming events, uh, Disconnecting, joining, changing rates, uh, signal strength. And then final one, Air Tool. This is the, the menu bar tool. Uh, this came up as an idea after attending my first uh, WLPC conference. Uh, it's just an easy way to capture, to do captures. You can do, do single or multiple channel capture. And by multiple, it's just, you know, hopping between channels. It's not simultaneously, but. You can do a quick assessment of all the channels. 
You can actually do a capture in Airtool using you know, all the channels and then the generated pickup, you can import it into Wi-Fi Explorer Pro and see the networks too. So you can, if you wanna, you, uh, you can have somebody install this tool, Airtool is free, so they can download it, install it, run a pickup on all the channels, send you the pickup and you, said, and you get to see the networks in Wi-Fi Explorer Pro. They don't have to have Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, for example. Uh, it can automatically launch Wireshark or your preferred product analyzer. There are some people that use some uh, custom software for that. Integrates with CloudShark and Mojo Packets, which are some uh, cloud services for analyzing captures. And it has some advanced features. Uh, it can do automatic data frame slicing, and this is, uh, it will take a look at the frame and just get rid of the data payload. And some tools provide that, but they're kind of, you have to set like a fixed length of the, you know, the slice you wanna keep. But it has a problem that the frames, depending if it's a quality uh, QoS frame or a regular frame, the size of the headers changes, so you might be, you know, chopping off some header information. So this does that uh, dynamically, so it will just get rid of the data part. You can limit by size, time, number of frames, rotate the capture, so if you can continuously do a capture, you see something going on, then, then you stop the capture and you get to analyze that part so it doesn't you know, consume uh, your hard drive. And it has some pro uh, support for, for doing some post-processing using Python. Scripts, you can set it so that once you are done capturing, it will launch a script and post-process that data and then you can do whatever you need with that data first. There's a script that I wrote for an, to anonymize a pickup, you know, change all the SSIDs and BSSIDs and, you know, addresses and device names and stuff. So if you want to share that pickup with someone and you don't want to reveal information, you can use that script and you can use it with R2. And that's pretty much. So that's my website, blog. I Sometimes I try to follow Please advise and write something. Um, email, you know, I'm, t I'm on Twitter, so I don't know if you have any questions. Or anything. <laughs>